It is a truism in Washington that you can't survive as Speaker of the House without friends. Mike Johnson, the latest Republican to try to keep the gavel, is learning that friends can appear in unlikely places, including the Democratic caucus. We'll discuss all of this and the latest developments in the war between Iran and Israel next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Certified financial planner professionals are proud to support Washington Week with The Atlantic. CFP professionals are committed to acting in their clients' best interest. More information at letsmakeaplan.org. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewen Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. So it seems that Mike Johnson, the unlikeliest speaker in recent memory, even Washington reporters who know everything, admit that they hadn't heard of him before his selection, might not be falling off the tightrope quite yet. The far right of his party has predictably turned on him, but Donald Trump hasn't, so far at least, and neither have the Democrats. Is Marjorie Taylor Greene inadvertently bringing back bipartisanship? I'll talk about this and the consequences for Ukraine and Israel funding with Eugene Daniels, a White House correspondent and co-author of Politico's Playbook. Sung Min Kim is a White House reporter with the Associated Press. Vivian Salama is a national politics reporter for The Wall Street Journal. And Graham Wood is my colleague and a staff writer at The Atlantic. Welcome, all. Um, Sung Min, you're in the hot seat. Just came from the White House. Um, so the House is poised to pass this $95 billion foreign aid package, finally. And if the Speaker gets this done, uh, it's going to be with the help of the Democrats, right. obviously, and his rightmost members, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, who may or may not be, for further discussion, the most powerful person on the Hill. Um, <laughs> they're pretty livid. But so what are the chances that Johnson gets this done and in so doing, also subverts his speakership. The chances, on the one hand, the chances are good that the foreign aid package will pass the House tomorrow. On a procedural vote earlier today, you had 316 votes. That is far past a majority. You helped sure. with a lot of Democrats, like you said, and a significant portion of Republicans as well. And, you know, that'll have to go to back to the Senate and then to the president's uh, desk for it to be signed. But the real question is what happens to Speaker Mike Johnson and his leadership position. What's been really interesting over the last couple of day days is that it's not just Marjorie Taylor Greene anymore who's threatening Mm -hmm. to oust him from his speakership. The numbers, slowly, they are growing. You have two more House Republicans now on the record saying they would support that what we call a motion to vacate, that maneuver, that mechanism that allows one person to oust a speaker. And why that matters. The mechanism that was fatal to Kevin McCarthy. Definitely, yes, that mechanism. And what's critical here is that the margins in the House are so narrow. After, uh, there's one person leaving uh, the House after this week, and he will have just a one-seat majority. That is almost untenable for any speaker to navigate, much less someone who is inexperienced and has a very raucous uh, far-right portion of the conference like Mike Johnson does. Right, right. Wait, I want to show you a, a, a chart um, uh, from, uh, just to look at this. This is These are the last Republican speakers, and you, you see that, um, you know, it's not a job that lasts forever the, <laughs> these days. Mike Johnson is at 178 days and counting. I'm not asking Eugene to, for you to predict the future, although can you predict the future? No, no not yet. Oh, okay. I'm learning. All right. All right. Uh, but, I, mean, I mean, what are the chances that, 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 that he finds himself in really dire straits? And what are the chances that Hakeem Jeffries the Democratic leader comes in to to save him. That's the key to this, right? The, the chances of, of whether or not he gets saved is all up to Hakeem Jeffries. If Hakeem Jeffries signals either in front of cameras or behind the scenes to Democrats that, hey, 
I will let you not come. <laughs> you, you can leave. We want you to, uh, to, to protect and defend him, um, Mike Johnson, in any kind of vote. Then they will do that. And I What's think the Democratic that, interest in keeping Johnson in power? The reason that they are, the people that are interested in it is one, they're worried about who would come next, right? Uh -huh. If Marjorie Taylor Greene, if you're not far right enough for her, people are worried about who's coming next. And also, he's doing something that Kevin McCarthy did not do. He's acting in good faith with the Democrats at this point, right? The way that he's negotiating and trying to get these bills to the floor is something that they wanted from Kevin McCarthy. He would not do. Also, Kevin McCarthy was kind of bad-mouthing Democrats um, on air day, a day after right. they saved his his um, bill, and so they were upset about that. They said, you know, we're not saving you. You're on your own. Right. So they're not getting that from, from Johnson. So Johnson's kind of cool, more, understated exactly. approach is, is, is it's working. working. It's working for Yeah, Democrats. Yeah, Vivian, you, you have any thoughts on, on whether he can maneuver this Ukraine bill to passage and maintain his job? It's looking increasingly likely that he will get the Ukraine bill over the finish line. Now, yeah. whether or not he maintains his job is another story. Remember, Ukraine was at one point a largely bipartisan issue. Most people in Congress yeah. on both sides of the aisle supported some sort of U.S. aid package. However, it has become increasingly a political flashpoint. And there is one person that has driven a lot of that rhetoric, and that is Donald Trump, the presumptive Republican nominee, right. where he made it um, increasingly become a political issue, where he would say, why are we giving billions of dollars to Ukraine? You know, the country is falling apart. We have problems at the border. And so that has grown, and we've seen then the, hard, the hardliners in the Republican Party pushing back on Ukraine aid. And that's where we are. It is not a substantive issue here. It is a political issue. Right. And now you see Donald Trump coming along and saying, well, okay, we can give them aid in the form of a loan, and everything has changed suddenly. I, I want to get to Trump. Before we get to Trump, I, I want to, so the news hours, Amna Devaz, uh, earlier this week, interviewed uh, President Zelensky in Kyiv, um, and he made his feelings about all of this quite clear. Listen to this uh, one segment. We wanted another way to get this money last year, but for today it doesn't matter. We need to survive and we need to defend our people. And that's why your decision, the ball is on your field. Yes, please just make decision. So I'm not, I'm not saying that what I'm going to play you now is a direct consequence of PBS's global reach, <laughs> but, but Speaker Johnson, you know, I, causation, correlation, we can have that debate later, but, but Zelensky's plea, it, it seems as if, you, you, you know, that kind of thinking that Zelensky is, is, is talking about there kind of moved Speaker Johnson. Listen to this. This is kind of an extended riff by Johnson on Ukraine in which he sounds like an old style Reagan Republican. Listen, listen to this. I think pr providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. I really do. I really do believe the intel and, and the briefings that we've gotten. I believe Xi and, and, and Vladimir Putin and, and Iran really are an axis of evil. I think they're in coordination on this. I think that Vladimir Putin would continue to march through Europe if he were allowed. To put it bluntly, I would rather send bullets uh, to Ukraine than American boys. My son is going to begin in the Naval Academy this fall. This is a live fire exercise for me, as it is so many American families. This is not a game. It's not a joke. We can't play politics of this. And I'm willing to take personal risk for that because we have to do the right thing, and history will judge us. So Graham, th this, is, this is pretty remarkable, given where Johnson was in the sort of Trumpian quasi-isolationist framework. Are we seeing something very unusual? Is this, is this the true Mike Johnson? I don't know if it's the true Mike Johnson, but having just been in Poland about a week ago, it seems to most Poles and to there's some parts of the world where, where the stakes are very high with these issues, that it's a person, Mike Johnson, getting a grip on reality. I mean, yeah. Poles are seeing this as arming Ukraine means stopping Kiev from falling and then mm -hmm. stopping Russia from getting to the Polish border, which, by the way, it's 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 been there before. So it's, it's a matter of someone who... who uh, you know, maybe he has to satisfy Marjorie Taylor Greene. Maybe not. Th these are these are political questions that are that are unfamiliar to parts of the world where they're wondering about their 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 future independence and prosperity. Right. I would love as an exercise to try to explain Marjorie Taylor Greene's politics <laughs> to the <laughs> prime minister of Poland, but <clears throat> that we'll do that on another show. The um, but Vivian, come come. Let's add on to that. Has Johnson found his inner Reagan, and is is that? Is he strong enough to withstand what might be coming from the isolationist wing? I, I think 
he would love to believe that he's found his inner ring. I mean, every Republican, Republican wants, wants to find their inner ring, right? Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that I've heard a lot from folks on the Hill is that a lot of this is his, he's driven by faith, yeah. that he believes because of his faith that he, it is imperative on the, upon the United States and incumbent upon the United States to help allies, including the Ukrainians who are on the front line of this war, mm -hmm. whether or not so it's So why did enough, he wait so long? Well, that's just the issue. There's so much political headwind, and it's taken so much time for the party to sort of uh, coalesce around this concept that we have to do this. And it was, as a standalone issue, I don't know if Ukraine aid would have passed, but we're lumping it in with other issues, support for Israel, support for Taiwan. And so it pads it with other, you know, with those issues that do have more bipartisan and support at the moment and can sort of get through the House a lot quicker. Also, remember, there was a lot of pushback on border security that Republicans wanted to to basically get a win by adding border security and linking it to Ukraine aid. And that is largely what slowed down um, the passage of this. And right. so this has been a major issue. It's, been, it's also it's his faith, but there's also like a practical aspect of this. When you he said, I believe the intel. He gets a lot more access mm -hmm. to information as speaker than he did as a kind of a rank and file backbencher in the House. So he is getting information that he wasn't getting before. This is not the, not the Mike John that many of us did not know when you when right. the, yeah. a, few, a few months ago. Right? This is Wait, a I want to study guy. that sentence. This is not the Mike Johnson that those we, that we didn't know. <laughs> we okay. know. He, Got he, it. He's, he's somebody we used to know. We know someone else. Right. But like the, the that is such an uh, integral part of understanding this change in him. He's in leadership. He's, just, he's in leadership. And there's a different way that you have to operate. His kind of dragging his feet, mm -hmm. in my estimation, has always been he does have to make it look like he's not being pushed by Democrats to do anything. And a lot a lot has changed in the months leading up to this. Talk, talk about that from uh, talk from the White House perspective. I mean, obviously, he's in leadership. He's getting intel. Now, obviously, if you're in the, uh, the paranoid nether regions of American politics, you think, oh, then he's, then he's like being influenced by the deep state. But what he's getting is, is real-time intelligence about the Ukrainian struggles, right? Is this part of, I mean, obviously, statutorily, you right. know, the speaker has to be involved in a lot of this, but is the White House cultivating Mike Johnson in a kind of way? Right. I mean, that was a huge part of the White House's strategy when it came to persuading Mike Johnson on the need for additional Ukraine aid. If you recall, literally the day after he was elected speaker, they brought him to the Situation Room mm -hmm. right away. This is where he met Jake Sullivan. He met other national mm -hmm. security officials. He met President Biden and spoke to him briefly for the first time. And he was exposed to the kind of information that he did not have as a rank and file member. He was then brought up for multiple meetings. He and National Security Committee chairman had regular briefings, uh, recently obviously had multiple conversations and that was part of the administration's strategy to convince him and give them real time concrete information to try to persuade him that this is real that this is a problem and what's been fascinating to watch when it comes to Mike Johnson is that you do see an evolution of someone understanding that you can't behave the way as a rank and file member than you would as a leader, and not only mm. as a leader of a House Republican conference, but a leader as a Speaker of the House, which is why you can go from someone who voted against Ukraine aid like Mike Johnson did to someone who was shepherding it through at the risk of his own job. It wasn't just, by the way, the administration who's been lobbying him. Foreign leaders have yeah. been lining yeah. up to see Mike Johnson. I interviewed the Polish president just this week who had been in to see him a few weeks ago, and one by one, they'd all been going in saying, you do not understand what this threat mm. means. Europe could fall. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians have no more ammunition. We are literally at the brink. And I think over time they have managed to get to him, especially people like President Duda of Poland, who's very persuasive. He's also an ally of Trump's and, and speaks sort of that language. Right, that he's they, a kind of a populist. Yeah. He's, yeah. A, he's, he's considered right wing and, and right. he appeals both to Trump. He did see Trump as well this week, mm -hmm. um, but he also met with Mike Johnson. Others have as well. And so progressively over time, I think those European uh, leaders and uh, parliamentarians, you know, foreign ministers, you name it, they have managed to really get to him and make him understand the stakes right. yeah. here. Great, great. This is this is the actual sort of largest question or most important question. What does this if this if this aid and obviously it's a, a big package Israel Taiwan but if this aid is freed up for Ukraine, uh, tell us what that means on the battlefield. Yeah, so it, it, these briefings are very sobering for one reason, which is. Anything could happen between now and the end of the year. And that, in, that could mean the collapse of the Ukrainian front line. The U collapse of the Ukrainian front line could mean the end of Ukraine as, a, as the state that, it, that, that, that we know it as. And uh, once that happens, 
then um, that line starts moving and the, the political calculations of Europe change completely. So I think some of the conversations that can happen in Washington can, can be about, okay, maybe we lose Ukraine. But a complete geostrategic reset that could happen with the collapse of a front line in Ukraine is an extremely sobering thought. And that's why I think it's been so urgent that these conversations happen with, with So the you people think it's charge. plausible that it's not just it's not just that Russia will solidify its position in Crimea and in the east. You think that without U.S. resupply, the, the front line could actually collapse and Russia could do what it couldn't do two years ago. Yes, yeah, that so is plausible. It seems like right now the, the line could be frozen. But, you know, the way these things happen is slowly, slowly, then all at once. And it, if like it Afghanistan. Did, yes, yeah. things can, can happen so quickly that it would be pretty urgent to at, at least keep the line where it is. Now, having a plan for it to, to actually resolve the war, of course, is what everyone would want. But the disaster, the catastrophe that would happen if the, if the line really collapsed would, would, right. would be unthinkable. Part of that catastrophe would be that Russia would then be in a better position to threaten actual NATO allies, and then we are required by treaty to come to their defense, as opposed to Ukraine, which is not in, in NATO. So this, this brings this interesting question of Trump's thinking about Ukraine these days. I mean, you, you all cover Trump closely. Is, there, is, is part of the reason that he's letting, and I use that term advisedly, letting Johnson do this, that, that, that Trump has shifted in his thinking at all? Any evidence of that? There was a statement out, a, a, a truth of whatever yeah. on, on, on social media, where he kind of alluded to <laughs> this, right? Forever. And this was after he had the a meeting truth with out, yes. exactly. Okay. It was after after his meeting with Duda, yep. where he talked about this kind of exact same thing. Basically, you know, let him give it to him, you know, <laughs> throwing up his hands kind of thing. Because at the end of the day, the thing that has been frustrating frustrated him the most during his presidency on the foreign policy side was the amount of money people weren't giving from the European countries, right? That the U right. people weren't giving enough to the UN, or they weren't uh, not enough of their um, own defense budgets were were being sent to, to the whole collective, and that is what's been frustrating him. So I think convincing him <laughs> that if we do this now, if you if you let Biden pay for this now, you if you become president again won't have to deal with this. That is a probably pretty persuasive argument for him. And th that is a truly emotional issue for Trump. The the idea that the Europeans are ripping us off, right? So if he feels better about that he's more apt to let Mike Johnson have some running room? He's hammered the Europeans on this issue, but the one thing that I think NATO allies have realized about him, has learned over time, and especially since he was in office, is that he's very transactional. He will provide, he will meet you halfway if you meet him back. And so this is the thing that the Or he'll saying. meet you 30% if you meet him 70%. Or, or, or I mean, he'll, he'll try to get as much Whatever as he can yeah. get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the it's fact not. of the matter is there's a negotiation at hand. And if you realize the way that he sort of does business, and we're talking about national security here, then you can, you can succeed in dealing with him. And that's how NATO allies have approached this now, where they said, you know, in private conversations, you don't have that public bluster of, you know, we're not going to give to Ukraine. We give billions and our border is falling apart. The country is falling apart. They go in there and they talk real strategy with him, real business. And they come out and they say, he's actually kind of reasonable when you have a conversation with him, as long as you are doing your part as a NATO ally. But right. the other thing that everyone, you know, in the NATO allies keep pointing out to Trump, and I think this resonates with him, is that P uh, dictators around the world are now looking at what, what Putin is able to do in Ukraine. And if the U.S. does not uh, show up and support Ukraine, if Ukraine falls, it will give um, a license for any dictator around the world or any aggressor around the right. world to kind of do this as well. Right. And so this is something that has resonated with Trump. And I think even, you know, with the potential for a second Trump presidency, he sort of wants to uh, pave the path for preventing Putin or any other uh, any right. other country from doing this. Right. Graham, I want to pivot to the Middle East, which is something that no president ever wants to do, but <laughs> I'm not president. Uh, uh, you've been particularly peripatetic these days. You were in Poland last week. You were in Israel. You just got back a, a day or so ago. Um, do you think that after last night's uh, Israeli limited response to the latest, uh, to, the, to the big barrage uh, of, of missiles earlier this week, do you think that we're done for right now in this in this back and forth between Iran and Israel? 
So I, I think this particular exchange is probably concluded because both parties have, have shown by the type of response that they've had, they didn't want it to get out of hand. They didn't want direct confrontation that's limitless, that keeps on going on. The, what they did want to see was what is the what happens with this iterative process where Iran does something, Israel does something, to get to a new equilibrium. And the new equilibrium is, is, is a dangerous one. I mean, both countries are apparently willing to attack each other from their own soil. But the question of whether it's done with Iran, the answer is no, never. It's never done because Iran has this long-term strategy of, of um, supporting not just enemies of Israel within the Israeli borders, but, but also just in the region. I mean, the Houthis right. in Syria, in, in Iraq, and Iran has shown that, that nothing's going to stop it from continuing to use that strategy. So this phase is, is over, but it's just one, one continuous struggle. So that, that brings me to, uh, to this question about President Biden and his relationship with the Prime Minister Netanyahu. It seems like there's been a little bit of a reset uh, in their relationship. And by that, I mean, it seems as if Netanyahu is actually listening a bit to Joe Biden now, or is that, am I over-indexing? Yeah, you, 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 you might be a little bit too optimistic. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, the hope was that it, during the, this last week, so much has changed. So much of the narrative could have changed, and it was a frozen and very bad narrative for a number of reasons uh, in the Gaza war. But what can Netanyahu make of this? I mean, there's many Israelis who wish he would just disappear, but the next best thing would be for something in the, the, the frozen conflict and the frozen situation to move. And right. maybe, that, maybe that could happen, but now I'm starting to sound naive, too. Right. <laughs> Vivian, you want to join in the naivete? Would you like to be appropriately cynical? I, I definitely, you know, no, I'm very cynical all the time. Um, I, I definitely don't think that it was a reset in the relationship. I think it just, if anything, kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, President Biden is still quite frustrated with Netanyahu. Um, he did not want him to uh, show any aggression toward, Israel, uh, to, toward Iran just because he was worried about a wider war. Right. Netanyahu did it anyway. Um, you know, I think they're, they're, they're relieved that it's, it was as limited as it is so far, but right. anything can turn. And so I think that the White House is still very concerned and they do not feel like they are, they have enough leverage at this point over Netanyahu to control his actions. And so it, that is a very uncomfortable right. place to be. Is, is there, go on. You, I, yeah. I mean, you can tell them the, the White House's response today, right? We were, we were right. in the briefing room today when Karine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary, would not even answer, wouldn't even broach the subject. And the reason is- She was asked directly. Asked directly about what happened. She kind of just started the briefing with like, I'm not gonna answer, you're gonna be pissed. You can keep asking, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not gonna answer. And that continued the entire briefing because they want to stay out of it as well. Because if they, if Iran and Israel are quiet and we stay quiet, the hope is that if the can does get kicked down the road, it goes much further than it was. And I will say on Biden and Netanyahu's relationship, it, it, these moments bring to mind the, the Bill Clinton adage of who's the superpower here? There was an expletive right, in there, but right, I'm going right, right. to spare because it's PBS. But like <laughs> that is the question, right? And you're, you're seeing a lot of experts saying it is starting to get embarrassing that President Biden is saying, don't do this Netanyahu, right. don't do this Israel, and then they they ignore him completely. But, but do you think that that without all this constant pressure that that Netanyahu might have done something more dramatic today to to Iran? Yes. I think it's possible. I mean, it was three <laughs> missiles. We got to understand too what type of pressure Netanyahu was under, and I'll I'll, I'll speak with a, a rare note of sympathy with Bibi here because. Okay. If, if your country is attacked with 300 drones and ballistic missiles and you do nothing, I don't think there's any country that would allow an attack like that to go completely unanswered. Yeah, and true. the answer that he gave w w was, um, you know, was not one that seems to have claimed many lives or property or, right. or, or much at all. So it's, it's a rather soft response mm -hmm. from that perspective. Right. Let's, uh, in, in just a minute we have, let's just turn to another titanic struggle, uh, one in, in New York, uh, the, the, the onset of the Trump trial. Um, uh, jury selection is finished. We're about to have the first opening arguments in a trial of a former president on a felony criminal, criminal charge. Uh, it's kind of kind of amazing. Yeah, it's just it's really remarkable, and and what's also remarkable too is just how the timing of the trial, the fact that it comes at one of the earliest uh, general election matchups in recent yeah. memory, and just the literal split screen that you're seeing with uh, you know Donald Trump and President Biden in terms of how they're using this time. Obviously, every day except for Wednesdays, Donald Trump has to be in that courtroom in New York. That 
that he, judge is not messing around. He is no, not messing gonna... around. And you have you have the brief comments that uh, Donald Trump makes as he comes and goes from the courtroom. Obviously, he's using the weekends to campaign. But you but then you have the and then you contrast it with President Biden, who was out on the road. He was in Pennsylvania for three days, a critical swing state. You were out there with yeah. him for yeah. one of the days. And he's able to really um, he's he's able to make his case to the American people. He's able to talk about his policies and that contrast with Donald Trump, which Trump doesn't get to do. Well, we're going to talk about that <laughs> next week. Obviously, unfortunately, we, we need to leave it there for now. Uh, we're out of time. But thanks to our panelists for joining us and for sharing your reporting. Uh, you can find Graham Wood's latest uh, coverage of the Israel-Palestine dispute in Israel-Iran on TheAtlantic.com. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by Consumer Cellular. Certified financial planner professionals are proud to support Washington Week with The Atlantic. CFP professionals are committed to acting in their clients' best interest. More information at letsmakeaplan.org. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.